Welcome back to Vintage Camera Digest. Today we're going back to 1969 to take a good look at Pentax's monster SLR, the Pentax 6x7. And we'll be headed back to the coolest junkyard in America, Old Car City, to run a few rolls of color film through it, so stay tuned. Oh, and I got a new hat. Yeah, I thought it was about time to mix up my hat game a bit in this classic Newport seems perfect for summer and discussing film cameras. And with that being said, we're gathered here today to talk about this beast, the Pentax 6x7. Now, as far back as the early 1960s, Asahi Pentax was formulating plans for a 6x7 format SLR. But development issues delayed production until Photokina 1966, when they unveiled a prototype they called the Pentax 220. 220 film had only been around for about a year prior to this, so the name is almost certainly a nod to the fact that this camera was capable of shooting the new film. Fast forward three years, and the camera was finally ready for production under a new name, the Pentax 6x7. Not a unique or catchy name, but straightforward and utilitarian in its description. And this would be the first SLR that used the ideal format of 6x7. Now, 6x7 cameras weren't new. The Connie Omega series of rangefinders had been shooting this format at least a decade prior. But Pentax was the first to market with an SLR to support this format, beating the Mamiya RB67 by only a year. And both of these companies chose radically different designs for their cameras. Where the RB67 resembled an oversized Hasselblad, the Pentax had a design more in common with their 35mm Spotmatic and they reasoned that this familiar form factor would help 35 millimeter users make the jump to medium format more easily. Since this was a rectangular format and not square, you also had to find a way to deal with the issue of shooting vertically. With the standard 6x6 SLR design, there was no vertical, or horizontal for that matter, just one option. So designing the 6x7 to be similar to a 35 just meant that vertical shots could be achieved simply by rotating the camera. Personally, I think this was a good move. Medium format cameras that shoot anything other than square format require a bit more effort to shoot in vertical orientation. The Mamiya RB67 solved this by using a revolving back. However, other cameras like the Mamiya 645 are rather unwieldy to shoot in vertical mode unless you have an added right hand grip. As a side note, some of the old folding cameras that shot the 645 format, like the Zenobia R from a few episodes ago, shoot vertical as the native format. So shooting horizontal then creates the same issue. But before we get too far in, let's revisit that notion of the ideal format that I mentioned just a little bit ago. What exactly does that mean? Well, long story short, it means that you won't need to crop the negative much at all to make an 8x10 size print. Square format, which is usually associated with medium format cameras, requires a significant amount of cropping to make an 8x10. If you're like me, you like to compose the image in camera to the best of your ability. Use the whole frame. So I don't want to have to crop out big chunks of my composition to fit a preset print size. Luckily, today we have more options for print size, but what if we want to frame our work? Well, we're back to the same problem. What 6x7 ideal format negatives do, though, is minimize the cropping necessary when making some standard enlargements. Moving on. The Pentax 6x7 series was produced from 1969 to 2009, and when it was released in 69, it had an entire system of lenses, prisms, both plain and metered, viewfinders, and other accessories immediately available, and it was aimed directly at the professional market. The earliest I can find an ad for the system in the U.S. was 1972, a full three years after its debut, and it's definitely leaning into its size and weight like it's a good thing. Well, it was the 70s after all, and Americans really loved our stuff big. The ad reads, The Honeywell Pentax 6x7 is a real heavyweight. About 7 by 6 by 5 inches, and it weighs in at about 5 pounds 4 ounces with standard lens and pentaprism. And yet, this scaled up 35 design is so well balanced that your grandmother could handle it at eye level. Well, I don't know about that, but I do like how they make no apology in the price. The price is hefty too, about $900, but well worth it. 
Now I'm going to save you the trouble of trying to figure out how much that would be in today's money. Adjusting for inflation, that's about $6,700 US and most definitely aimed at the pro market. Anyway, it's an interesting ad. I've got it on the Vintage Camera Digest website, so I'll leave a link to it in the description in case you want to check it out. But over its 40 years of production, the Pentax 6x7 series went through four different versions. The original 6x7 didn't include a provision for mirror lockup. And since the mirror slap on this thing isn't insignificant, it could negatively impact sharpness when using slower shutter speeds. So in 1976, the camera was improved and the mirror lockup feature was added. And that's what I have here. The camera was updated again in 1989 and was renamed the Pentax 67. It got a new shutter and the meter prism was updated to use a silicon photo diode instead of the old cadmium sulfide cell. Externally though, the 67 was pretty much the same except for the new Pentax logo on the prism. In 1998 though, the Pentax 67 II was released and it was pretty much an entire redesign. It was similar in size and shape, but everything was updated with new technology. Luckily, all the lenses will fit any of these versions. And speaking of lenses, that's really what I consider a major selling point for this system. Over the 40 years of production, Pentax would release over 55 different lenses for this series, most of them at f4 or faster. And that includes an 800mm f4, which has got to be one of the fastest super telephoto lenses ever made for any format. The lenses I have in my kit are the 55mm f4, the 90mm 2.8 leaf shutter, the 135mm f4 macro, and a 150mm 2.8. The standard lens for the system is the 105 2.4, and it's highly regarded as one of the system's best lenses. I, however, don't have the 105. I have the 90, and I'd say that it's still more or less standard focal length for the 6x7 format, maybe a little wide, but it gives me the option of flash synchronization up to 1 500th of a second. But that's not the real reason I bought it. The real reason is because I saw it listed for about $30, and this was years before I even had the camera, because you know, some deals you can't pass up for any reason. You know that's right. And while we're on the topic of lenses, I want to point out the stop down lever. The camera itself doesn't have one, so it's included on the lens. In normal mode, it's usually set to auto position, but sliding the switch counterclockwise will stop it down to the taking aperture. If you want to lock it in stop down mode, lift up on it slightly while sliding and it will lock in place. When you're done, just press it down and it'll snap back into place. Anyway, let's look at the camera for a bit. Up on the top left shoulder is the shutter dial with speeds from 1 to 1 1 thousandth of a second, plus B and X for using flash. And let me add right here that the flash sync speed of the focal plane shutter is a measly 1 30th of a second. So if I have to deduct any points from this system, that's going to be the first one. But that's also why they offered two different leaf shutter lenses in that lineup. Right next to the shutter speed dial is the battery check light, and you can check its status by pressing the battery check button right on the back. Back to the front. Beneath the shutter dial on the left side of the lens mount, you have two PC sockets, one for FP and one for X-Sync. And right below that is the lens release button. To remove a lens, just slide the release button toward the body and turn the lens counterclockwise about a quarter of a turn. And there you go. Over on the right shoulder is the frame winding lever and the frame counter. A full wind of just over 180 degrees will get you to the next frame. Beside that is the shutter release and locking collar. And over on the side of the body under the winder is the switch for 120 or 220 film. On the right side of the lens mount is the mirror lockup switch. It's handy to have this, but be aware that if you set the mirror in the up position, there's no way to bring it back down other than firing the shutter and winding the film. And I found, as you may have seen before in one of my other episodes, that it's relatively easy to trip the mirror lockup just by handling the camera. So it might be of benefit to hold off on winding the film until you're ready for the next shot. On the shoot we're about to do, I'm just going to put a small piece of gaff tape over it to hold it in place. On the front of the body, there are four strap lugs you can use to attach the strap. And as far as I'm aware, the strap will need to be equipped with the correct Pentax fasteners to hold it securely. Moving on to the prism, it can be removed by pressing these two chrome buttons on either side and lifting it off. 
and you can replace it just by setting it on top and clicking it down into place. It's about the easiest prism removal I've ever used. On the bottom of the camera, we have two film chamber locking keys and a battery compartment. A quick turn of its key gives quick access to the battery holder, which by the way is a 4L R44 or PX28 six volt. And it's 100% necessary for using the camera as the shutter is electronically controlled. If you try to operate the shutter when the voltage is too low or when there isn't a battery installed, the mirror will flip up halfway and then it's going to lock. To get the mirror back into ready position, you'll need to replace the battery, then press this little button on the front. This is the mirror reset switch and will complete the mirror cycle so you'll be ready to roll. Something to be aware of though is that the shutter will not fire unless film is loaded. So if you get one of these and it doesn't seem to work, don't be alarmed, it's supposed to do that. But if you really need to operate the shutter with no film, there is a workaround and it's straight from the Pentax 6x7 manual. Open the camera back by pulling down on this little tab. And once the back's open, then use your finger to turn the small knurled portion of the frame counter to move it past one. We're gonna keep it there, then we're gonna close the back. Now the camera thinks it's loaded and the shutter will work as normal. Now, let's talk about loading some film. I'm going to admit that I've struggled with loading this camera at times, but there's a simple trick that will make this go a lot easier. And that is just to make sure that the hole at the top of the film spool is aligned with the gear at the top of the chamber. So let's do this. On the bottom of the camera, there's locking keys for each chamber. And over on the left side of the body is the back latch. Just pull down on it and the back will open. Also going to take this locking key, I'm going to rotate it to unlock and pull down on it so we can put the new film in. When loading film, I'd recommend not removing the film tape until you get the film in place, but once it's in place and the bottom key is locked in place, go ahead and remove it. First, we're going to make sure that this is in the same position as that. So once we have removed the tape, we're going to pull leader over to the take-up spool. It doesn't pull easy, but pull a little bit more than you normally would and insert into the take-up spool and wind the film so that the arrow lines up with the correct start mark. And in this case, it's gonna be 120. Also, at this time, before you close the back, make sure that the pressure plate is set to the correct film. and wind on and it will automatically stop when it gets to the first exposure and that about covers it. So let's go create. I'm headed back out to Old Car City in White, Georgia. So I was out there last with the Canon T90 way back in September, but this time I'm taking a few rolls of Fuji color film and I hope to be able to take advantage of that color. So let's go. I've got the Pentax 6x7, and I've got some Fuji 400 color film. Gonna shoot a couple of rolls of that. Uh, and then I do have some black and white in case I need to get into that. But today I'm gonna be looking specifically for some color to add to this since I've got the color film. So let's, let's fight off these mosquitoes and see what we can find. So I've got my spot meter out here. So today uh, I'll be shooting, trying to find a highlight spot and the darkest shadow spot, measure both of those, and this meter is gonna average that or actually find the median in that, uh, in between the two. So I have the 55 millimeter F4 on right now, and I do have a tripod, but um, I'm gonna try to handhold it for a little while and just see what happens. So right now I've metered this shot here at, uh, at 1 60th of a second at F4. So I wanna take advantage of some shallower depth of field today if I can. Uh, so let's get this shot done. But the lighting has changed, so I need to re-meter. Let's wait on the sun because I really need that uh, extra stop. Cause right now it's telling me 1 60th of a second at F2.8 and I need to get the sun back out here or I could just put it on the tripod and be done with it. That's probably what I should do. Put it on the tripod and then I won't have to worry about it. 
think my luck has been okay in the past hand holding this monster but it's not going to be at one thirtieth of a second Let's move this out of the way. Also going to put a cable release in here. Give this just a little bit more light. All right, so that was one thirtieth of a second and one at one fifteenth of a second. All right, let's go find another spot. So, got a little shot lined up through here. Got the uh, the front grill of both of these cars in the shot. And since I've got shooting down, I want to create a little bit more depth of field. So let's just see what I can get metered up here. So the highlight spot here is obviously this headlight. And that gives me F11. Gives me F16 at 1 15th of a second. All right, let's put that in memory and then let's see. All right, so there is my shadow area in the wheel well of this car here. Put that in memory. 1 15th of a second at F8. Well, I'm gonna go 1 8th of a second at F11. Wound up. All right. All right. That's good. So the last time I was out here, I found one of these over on the other side of the uh, property. It's a Borg Ward, which is a German car. I had never seen one before. But I'm also looking for hood ornaments today. So may put the 135 f4 on and uh, see what I can get <clears throat> so now that I got it framed up let's get a reading let's make sure I clear all my memory all right so I've got a couple of highlight spots like the chrome definitely so I get f16 I want to highlight let's save that so where is my shadow side right here in the grill all right 1 15th of a second at f8 i'm gonna go 130 at 5.6 because i don't want super deep depth of field got a 5.6 right So before I completely pack it up on this spot, I'm gonna also get a horizontal of this. Do y'all see all these mosquitoes around here? Oh my God, I'm get eaten up, I'm get carried off. Let's wind. So the same exposure as before. Wind it for the next shot. Last time I was out here, there were some places that I didn't get to that I had remembered I had been to before. Not exactly sure where or how I found it before. So maybe, maybe I'll be able to find those other places today. So for this shot, I'm having, I'm getting a little bit of the hood of this truck in the shot, but 
I'm really focused on that nice turquoise color Ford V8 in the back. I'm not sure if that was the original color, but that's what it is now. So the sun has come back out just a bit. I'm gonna go with a slightly deeper depth of field this time. Let's clear the memory. All right, so I gotta find my highlight spot. And I think the highlight spot's gonna be this headlight right there at F11. I'm gonna save that. And let's look at, this is not actually in the frame, but it is in the same light. 5.6 at 30. I want to go to 11. That's gonna give me one eighth of a second at F11. Let's make sure I have the aperture set correctly. 11, one eighth of a second. Wind the film and the sun's gone back behind the cloud. Recheck. All right, so we are gonna go with one quarter of a second at F11. All right. All right. So behind me, I've got this, I don't know, whatever it is, it's old. And I've got some hubcaps on the trees and I've got this sign in the back that says chop shop so and there's this little path that goes through here and you've got all of this green up through here and just a second ago it was all overcast and it had this really melancholy look to it so i'm going to wait on that overcast again and get ready and get this thing metered up so as soon as it hits we'll shoot it all right so we're ready here i'm getting 1 15th of a second at 5.6 get it before the sun comes out again now let's do one where we have a deeper depth of field like f11 which is going to be one quarter of a second at f11 okay All right. All right, before I move on, I'm gonna get the front of this at an angle and get some of the hubcaps and the trees in the back. I've got two more shots on this roll of film. So we'll finish this roll up right here. All right, so highlight area, 16 and a half, save it. Shadow area, 2.0, save it. So I'm looking at five, six and a half at one thirtieth of a second. Let's go F8 at one fifteenth of a second. All right, and here we go. Let's meter that one more time. The sun's sort of changing as we go here. Still got the same highlight, memory, shadow. All right, so F8 at 30, F8 and a half at 30. Let's go F11 at 15th of a second. All right, that should finish up that one roll. All right, so let's get the film changed and go in search of the next shot. All right, so behind me, we've got this 
sort of spot where the sun is shooting through the trees here. Got some nice green in the back. So I'm gonna get this shot before we lose this sun here. I'm shooting with the 50 millimeter still. All right. Looking for a highlight. Let's just go there. All right, and let's look for a shadow. Let's go there. 30 at F8. Or let's go 160 at 5.6. Good deal. I guess the mosquitoes have gotten all my blood because they sort of left me alone right now. If I'm looking a little pale, let me know. So here we have a junked Ford Pinto with a cat on top looking like exactly that's where that cat needs to be. So here's a shot. All right, so there's my highlight. And let's see, there is my shadow. It gives me 1 30th of a second at eight and a half. I want shallow depth of field. So I've got 1 1 20th of a second at F4 which is what I'm gonna be going for. All right. All right, moving on. All right, so I like this car. I shot it last time I was out here, but this time I've got color. So I'm gonna shoot it again. So I'm liking this shot sort of right here. Now, the 50 won't be this wide and impressive, but we're gonna see what we can get. All right, so as before, we've got the sun going in, moving in and out. If I shoot it with the sun, it's a little bit brighter than I think I want it to be. But let's see. All right, so there's me a highlight. Shadow, all right, that gives me 120 at 5.6. I want, uh, that's fine, let's go with 120 at 5.6. And let's do 1 250th at F4. We'll see. So I'm gonna jump in here just to warn you that the rest of this photo shoot is without audio because there's either a glitch with my wireless system or there's a glitch with the GoPro media mod. I don't know, but anyway. So I'm just gonna play some nice relaxing music, maybe put a couple of sound effects for the shutter in there so that it looks like we're doing something.
thought I was recording that last little bit. Apparently, I didn't hit record. So, but what we got was this. Sort of a close-up shot of that trunk coming out of the bumper. Now, I've got one more shot, and I'm headed back toward the entrance. And I'm sure I can get one shot on the way out. Well, that was an eventful shoot. I got stung by bees, nearly carried away by mosquitoes, and I proved once again that I've got to work out some kinks in capturing audio in the field. In any case, I hope you enjoyed a relaxing shoot without having to hear me babble on about everything. I'm really glad I chose to do color for this shoot. This was the first time I've used the Fujifilm Pro 400H, and I really like the results, so I'll be stocking up on some more of that. It was perfect for this shoot. And I think the camera performed really well. Even though I used the tripod for everything, there were several shots where the shutter speed was 1 15th of a second, and I noticed no camera shake, even without using the mirror lockup feature. But again, if I have to deduct any points from this system, in addition to the slow flash sync speed of 1 30th of a second, I'll also add that some of the lenses don't allow for very close focusing distance. Well, specifically the 150. That would be the ideal length for portraiture, but the minimum focusing distance is only five feet or about one and a half meters. So if you really want to get close to your subject, you'll probably want to pick up the 135 millimeter F4 macro because it'll focus down to 2.5 feet or about three quarters of a meter. But there's also extension tubes set if you need to get closer than that. And Pentax also released a set of close-up filters as well. And speaking of accessories, one iconic piece of this system that I haven't mentioned is the left-hand wood grip. I don't have that, obviously, but people who do say that it really does improve the handling, even though it's not really that bad without it. If you're really interested in this system, though, in addition to that old advertisement I mentioned earlier, I've got a copy of an early sales brochure on the website that you can download for free to take a look. I'll leave that link in the description as well. Summing it all up, I really, really enjoy shooting with the Pentax 6x7. It's big, it's heavy, but it's awesome. And I will happily lug this thing around anywhere. And maybe my grandmother would have too. I'll see you next time. <laughs>